uh, endocrine enzymes. Uh, we are uh, very happy to have Dr. Bayes here to uh, talk to us about sick fat or adiposopathy um, as the most common cause of endocrine disease. Uh, Dr. Bayes um, is from Louisville. Um, he went to medical school and uh, residency and fellowship here. He has been uh, in Louisville as the president of um, and medical director of uh, Louisville Metabolic and Atherosclerosis Research Center um, for the last uh, 30 years or so. Uh, he has uh, been a very successful investigator and also a clinical endocrinologist. Uh, he has um, served as an investigator in over 500 phase one to four clinical trials uh, for treatment of, di of um, high cholesterol, uh, dyslipidemia, obesity, diabetes, hypertension, and other metabolic disorders. Um, he has um, uh, served as the um, um, uh, chief scientific officer of the Obesity Medicine Association, has held very uh, prominent uh, uh, roles at the Obesity Society and also uh, at the National Lipid Association and has um, being the chairman and co-chairman of the Obesity Medicine Association's Obesity Algorithm. Um, he has um, a number of uh, um, uh, publications to his uh, credit, over 250 uh, on PubMed. Um, and uh, his uh, special area of expertise is uh, in uh, obesity and sick fat. Um, he's right, written nice reviews on this topic. Um, so uh, we welcome him to present this talk and uh, get started. Okay, well, thank you very much. This is a, a truly a great honor to present the Endocrine Grand Rounds here um, for the University of Louisville. These are my disclosures. The objectives uh, of this presentation are basically to, um, uh, to discuss the um, various aspects of obesity and how it contributes to uh, metabolic disease. So if you look at the uh, very first slide, sick fat adiposopathy is the most common cause of endocrine disease. And I know that's a provocative title, but where I wanna get to at the end of this presentation is ho hopefully um, everyone will have a better understanding that <clears throat> the complications we see with obesity are not just comorbidities. I hate that term uh, because the suggestion is they just sort of happen to be together. And I don't think it works that way at all. Uh, if you see a patient who doesn't have diabetes, hypertension, and dyslipidemia, but then gains 20 pounds and now has got all three, that's not just happenstance. It's not just an accident, okay? Uh, I think that there are causal mechanisms by which you have an increase in the fat cell size, increase in adipose tissue expansion. That results in, in endocrinopathies and immunopathies where the fat, the, the adipose tissue becomes sick, and that uh, directly contributes to the diabetes, hypertension, and dyslipidemia. So that's where I want to end up with at the end of the program. A lot of the slides you're going to see here, all, all the slides you're going to see here comes from the obesity algorithm. Uh, for which I am a uh, lead author. And they're just, it's, it's that, you know, over a thousand references and, and around 800 slides. So obviously I'm not gonna cover them all, but uh, I'm going to give an overview of the uh, content that's uh, covered in the obesity algorithm. But even with an overview, uh, I can't cover everything, obesity. So in, in, in case you haven't come to an appreciation about this, I mean, I think obesity is the next big thing because it's, it's, it's so complex, it's so ubiquitous, uh, and there's just so much going on with obesity research right now. It's a very exciting time. Uh, but if at any point in the future, you want a more in detailed discussion of uh, you know, nutrition, physical activity, energy expenditure, which is just fascinating, obesity paradox, set points, myths, motivational interviewing, technologies, uh, anti-obesity medication, supplements, you know, how does that fit in with our patient care? Bariatric surgery and investigational agents, again, just, just so much. All right, so how do we define obesity? Finally, 
Well, I think most of us uh, understand that obesity truly is a, a disease. And so the Obesity Medicine, Medicine Association defines obesity as a chronic, progressive, relapsing, and treatable multifactorial neurobehavioral disease wherein an increase in body fat promotes adipose tissue dysfunction and abnormal fat mass physical forces resulting in adverse metabolic, biomechanical, and psychosocial health consequences. That definition took us probably around three to four weeks and, uh, and multiple uh, revisions, uh, but that's where we are today. Most people think obesity is just diagnosed by body mass index, and I'm here to argue that, yes, from a population standpoint, uh, that's probably fine. But for the individual, we do a lot of DEXA scanning. That's the, uh, the dual X-ray absorptiometry, and that's the gold standard for clinical trials. And we have a lot of people that sign up and get DEXAs who, are, uh, who want to know more about their body composition, but also uh, people who are into fitness, um, physique competitions, bodybuilders, uh, this types of thing. There are multiple different types of classifications where the cutoff points for uh, percent body fat in definition of uh, obesity. This is just one. This is a classification from the Obesity Medicine Association. And then with the DEXA scans that we do, we also measure the android fat, which is the uh, subcutaneous abdominal adipose tissue plus the visceral fat. And then we also measure the visceral adiposity. And as you know, it's that visceral fat that best correlates with cardiovascular disease, and we'll discuss why that that is. But that's great if you measure it, but if you don't know how to interpret the values, what good is it? And so as of a couple of years ago, uh, the Obesity Medicine Association came out and said, here are some metrics and here's how you interpret uh, the results of a DEXA scan when you're looking at visceral and, and uh, adipose tissues. Cause, because body composition, is so critical. I can't think of a single test that I order on a patient where I get more information than a DEXA scan. It's just absolutely extraordinary, the wealth of information. Now, of course, there's different ways uh, to get uh, body composition. You don't have to do a DEXA. I mean, yes, you can get a percent body fat with calipers and bod pods and bioelectrical impedance and several other things, but Again, within the context of our clinical trials and within the context of our research site, uh, we do DEXAs. But all of these have their pluses and minuses and pros and cons and such. Um, so good, good to have a good to have a good uh, an understanding of these very different methodologies. So here's the DEXA scan. Uh, why is it the gold standard? Because you get a percent body fat, you get your Android fat. Many machines, not all, but many machines give you the Android fat and the visceral fat. Lean body mass, very interesting. And then finally, yes, you get bone mineral density. Now you need to be a little careful because many of the places that advertise that they do DEXA only do DEXA with, for bone mineral density. So it's just a matter of software and training of the staff and such, but still, if you're trying to get a body composition analysis and you just send them to a place that does bone mineral density, they're not, they're not gonna know how to do that. So here's just an illustrative example, a very practical example. Uh, here are uh, DEXA scans done on the Green Bay Packers. Now you have probably seen football players, and particularly offensive and defensive linemen. And you're like, oh no, you know their percent body fat's maybe going to be pretty high. Certainly their visceral and android fat's high, but they are not because again they have so much muscle mass and they're highly, you know, they're the most elite of athletes. And you can see here, even with the offensive linemen, uh, we're talking about maybe, you know, three pounds of visceral fat. You'd like it less than one pound. Uh, but trust me, of all the patients that we do our DEXA scan on, I mean, three's not that bad. Uh, three pounds is not that bad. Now, obviously, if you go down here to the running backs and the wide receivers and such, you can see here they truly do have visceral fat less than a pound and android fat less than three pounds, which is what you want. But again, even, even among those that you could just look at and you think they'd be a lot worse, it's really not their, that way. And because they have so much muscle mass, their percent body fat, again, not, not what you would expect. So that's why you got to measure. All right, so why is it important 
from an endocrine standpoint, to know about adipose tissue and body fat? Well, because what happens is, as I mentioned before, if you get adipocyte hypertrophy or visceral fat accumulation, you get deranged endocrine immune responses that cause, okay, they're not just associated with, they're not comorbidities, they cause the increase in blood sugar, increase in blood pressure, dyslipidemia, other metabolic diseases. And then we, on the other, other side, we got the fat mass disease, where it's just the weight, the physical forces alone that cause things like uh, immobility, tissue compression, uh, 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 stress on weight-bearing joints and tissue friction and these types of things. So if we look at fat mass uh, diseases, where have we seen that clinically, uh, you know, most in, say, in the past year and a half? And that's with COVID, COVID-19. Because as we know, people with the obesity have a sort of a paradoxical immune response. On the one hand, their immune response um, is suppressed in a way that makes them more susceptible to COVID-19 infection or other viral respiratory tract infections. But with COVID-19, uh, once they get infected, then it kind of goes the other way. You get a hyper response, what we call cytokine storm. And so therefore you end up with um, uh, much worse on uh, lung infections and such. And then you add on to that the fact that they have a limited uh, pulmonary function due to the fat mass. And it's no, should be no surprise that people with the obesity have an increase in morbidity, mortality, and hospitalization with the COVID-19 compared to others. Well, what about the sick fat disease? So that's the fat mass disease. What about the sick fat disease, the adipose apathy? What about that? Well, what normally happens is when you have positive caloric balance, you kick in with these, these um, you know, uh, various proteins and such that increase the proliferation and differentiation of, of adipose tissue. And you can just see the ex examples here, the SRABP1 or the PPAR gammas. I mean, that's how, that's how thiazolidine dions work, right? That's how PPAR gamma agents work. They increase the proliferation and differentiation of fat cells increasing uh, adipocyte and adipose tissue functionality, and it brings down your blood sugars. So you're actually adding fat to treat a disease caused by too much fat. So very interesting, very interesting. Um, the other thing that can happen is if you cannot store, if your positive caloric balance is such that you cannot adequately store it in the peripheral subcutaneous adipose tissue, that energy overflow has got to go somewhere. Where's it going to go? Well, it's going to go to your visceral fat, your abdominal uh, subcutaneous adipose tissue, might go to your liver, liver or muscle or pancreas or heart or kidney. So you get intraorgan fat. There's all sorts of functional changes that take place that causes the adipocytes and adipose tissue to become dysfunctional. They become sick. And we end up with all these endocrinopathies. I mean, here's just a a list of the type of endocrinopathies that take place. And here's a list of the immunopathies that take place. So it should be no surprise that the increase in body fat directly contributes to the most common uh, endocrinopathies or endocrine diseases we see in clinical uh, practice. The thing to know though is uh, whatever pathogenic effect results from the obesity or the overweight, whether or not that translates into metabolic disease very much depends upon your other body organs. So it's this harmony of body functions. And that's been known for centuries, that there's this harmony between our body organs that either that is a large determinant as to whether we remain healthy or whether we develop a disease. And if we do develop the disease, uh, the metabolic uh, manifestations of adiposopathy, then these are the most common endocrine diseases we see in clinical practice. Well, it isn't just the, um, uh, it isn't just the, uh, um, the obesity that can contribute to, uh, uh, to many of these metabolic abnormalities. Sometimes we take concomitant medications that can also uh, contribute to the diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia. But what's also important is once we start treating endocrine disease, Many times the medication choices we use can either worsen or improve the obesity. So there's just so many, there's so much circular things going on in endocrinology. 
the thing that you need to know about uh, concomitant medications is um, be very cautious in how you read the literature. So say, for example, if you look at antipsychotics, many of them are shown to increase body fat, but it's not for everybody. And these studies weren't done specifically to look at the effects of antipsychotics on, on body weight. So what you get is you get a mean value or a median value, but the variability is just extraordinary. You can put somebody on an antipsychotic, they may actually lose weight. So it's very hard to look at an individual patient and uh, predict what's going to happen with some of these um, medications. But you can look at the overall results, and yes, many antipsychotics can contribute to weight gain. But so can our cardiometabolic treatments. For example, uh, some beta blockers, more associated with weight gain than weight loss. Uh, certainly insulin, it's the phonyureas and the thiazolidine dions that we just talked about, and the maglitinides, increase body fat. Because they're driving, they're, increased, they're either increasing insulin or they're increasing uh, uh, insulin activity, and that's driving those, those, that energy into your fat cells, which then store it, and that's, and that's the very definition of overweight and obesity. Now, there are some anti-diabetes um, medications that are more associated with weight loss, like the metformin, GLP-1 re receptor agonists, the SGLT2 inhibitors and such. We're going to talk more about that here in a minute. So let's talk about specific metabolic diseases. The first thing to say is not everything... Not every illness that a patient has is due to their obesity. We do that a lot. Uh, we, we, we tend to say, well, if you have the obesity, any problem that you have, it's got to be due to the obesity, and that's, that's not fair, and it's not scientifically accurate. The fact is you can get diabetes and high blood pressure and dyslipidemia in a person with overweight and obesity, and it has nothing to do with the overweight and obesity. We, we need to keep that in mind, okay? I think... I think it's important to keep that in mind, that there are other potential causes, even if a patient has overweight and obesity. From a cardiovascular standpoint, oh, my goodness. If you're not aware, the world is about to change here in about the next three to five years. The world, as you know it, as an endocrinologist, is getting ready to change because where we are now with obesity is exactly where we were 30 years ago with diabetes, hypertension, and dyslipidemia. And so what is the sentinel event that's going to take place that's going to change your world and the world of your patients? So I want you to think about that. What, what is going to happen that's going to change the world? What binary switch is going to take place? Think about that. So as we know, uh, obesity affects the cardiovascular system in multiple different ways, hemodynamics, structure, function, atherosclerosis, immunopathies, and endocrinopathies, and the ECGs, the, the, the um, electrocardiogram abnormalities, quite frequent uh, in patients with the overweight and obesity. Um, so, so what is the overall scheme as to why obesity may contribute to cardiovascular disease? Well, you have positive caloric balance and unhelpful nutrition and physical inactivity, and you're not able to store the excess energy in your peripheral subcutaneous adipose tissue. So you get this energy overflow, and you get the adiposopathy. And what happens is you have an increase in the pericardial fat, which is directly pathogenic. You have an increase in intracardiac fat, which can cause dysrhythmias. You have an increase in visceral fat, which is associated uh, with cardiovascular disease, and you have an increase in hepatic and skeletal muscle fat also associated with cardiovascular disease. And why is that? Well, because uh, if you think about it, the, there is a direct correlation between the accumulation of the visceral fat and the epicardial fat. So that's the first thing, is you get, you get this direct correlation. And that should be no surprise to you as endocrinologists because you know that visceral and epicardial fat share the same mesodermal embryological origin. So you already know this, okay? And this, and both of these, whether it be the visceral fat or the epicardial fat, are highly correlated with coronary calcium, coronary calcium. So there we go, a direct correlation or a direct mechanism 
by which uh, you have the obesity contributing to cardiovascular disease because it is that epicardial fat accumulation uh, and that increase in, in active fat around the heart that, could, again, causes these endocrinopathies and these immunopathies. And you can see all these inflammatory factors that contribute to heart failure, and not just heart failure, but heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. And if you're not an expert on that, you better be. Because uh, if, I, if I had to think the one cardiovascular disease that the endocrinologists ought to, ought to be the, the, the most, ex, have the greatest degree of expertise, it would be heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Because that's, that is just so common in, in many of the patients that we see. But there's also the atherosclerotic process with atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, cardiac dysrhythmia, fatty infiltration of the heart, and as we talked about, increase in coronary calcium. But it doesn't stop there, does it? It isn't just the adiposopathy or the sick fat. The fact is, even fat mass disease by itself can contribute to cardiovascular disease. Uh, there can be mechanical restraints on, on dilatation of the heart, which contributes to what? Heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. We used to call that diastolic heart failure, didn't we? And then, of course, sleep apnea with the hypoxia and the increase in epinephrine and swings in thoracic pressure and increase in thromboembolic events. So the, the general mechanisms that I'm trying to get to, and this goes back to the very first slide, is when you get adipocyte hypertrophy and adipose tissue accumulation, you get uh, intracellular hypoxia, intraorganelle stress, where you end up with these immunopathies and these endocrinopathies and this lipotoxicity that contribute uh, to the most common uh, endocrine abnormalities we see in clinical practice. And from a cardiovascular standpoint, as I already mentioned, there are direct effects of the adiposopathy or the increase in body fat and indirect effects. Um, as far as how you treat uh, patients uh, with the obesity and cardiovascular disease, that has undergone a revolutionary change, hasn't it? I mean, there was a time not more than, what, five years ago, where we were quite pessimistic that any anti-obesity, that any anti-diabetes drug uh, was going to have favorable cardiovascular outcomes. We thought they would, but the, the studies, you know, they kept, we did these studies. They kept being shot down. It's like, no, 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 not helpful, not helpful, not helpful. And then suddenly, out of nowhere, we had the SGLT2 inhibitors and the GLP-1 receptor agonist. And I got to tell you, again, I've been doing this for 30 years. I never saw the SGLT2 inhibitors coming. I wrote uh, two uh, overall review papers, had them published. And I, my essential message was, yeah, they're nice drugs. They'll do okay in the market, I guess. Uh, they have some interesting properties, but what do you think that great? And then if, you, if you've ever heard the story about the IPAREG study and the statistical analysis plan they had made and, the, and how this just sort of shocked the world when we showed favorable effects on cardiovascular outcome, that's, that's a whole other talk by itself, but it's just, just a fascinating story. Um, and then what about treatment of patients with cardiovascular disease? with mild congestive cardiomyopathy. Well then, I mean, you gotta start with the, all these, most of these studies started with metformin, nutrition, and physical activity, and then they added the SGLT2 inhibitors. Uh, so if you have mild congestive cardiomyopathy, I think you've gotta go with the SGLT2 inhibitors. On the flip side, if you have the obesity, and that's your main focus, and they don't have congestive cardiomyopathy, I think the GLP-1 receptor agonist is pretty good choice. And then this huge uh, legend here, I'm just writing that out for you, give you, just giving you a glimpse of all the research that's ongoing right now in cardiovascular disease and obesity uh, and such. As far as where we are today, uh, there is no drug, no anti-obesity drug that's approved for treatment uh, to reduce cardiovascular disease risk um, in patients with the obesity. Doesn't exist yet. I think we're going to have them. Don't have them today. But what we do have is we do have an anti-obesity agent, loraglutide, that at the 3.0 uh, milligram per day dose is, is 
uh, indicated to treat the obesity. And you might say, well, but wait a minute, the 1.8 milligram uh, dose in patients with the diabetes mellitus, most who had the overweight and obesity did have cardiovascular outcomes. And that's true, but that's not how drug development works. Okay, so even though uh, loraglutide 1.8 milligrams per day in diabetes has an indicated use to reduce cardiovascular disease, that does not mean that the 3.0 for obesity has an indication to reduce cardiovascular disease risk. I think we all agree, we hope that it would, but we don't have, we don't have a definitive clinical trial at that dose for that purpose um, to get that indication. All right, so what about increasing blood sugars? Very simply, the sick fat causes the immunopathies and the endocrinopathies and increase in circulating free fatty acids that contribute to insulin resistance and beta cell dysfunction. Here's insulin signaling, which um, I'm sure all of you know, uh, where, um, where uh, in patients who have uh, insulin resistance and such, uh, that that's usually, not always, usually due to post-receptor uh, insulin sign signaling abnormalities and such, but this just, um, this is what insulin is supposed to do. But again, if you do have these endocrinopathies and immunopathies, uh, that contributes to uh, uh, impaired responsiveness uh, to the insulin. And what are some of these, uh, what are some of these adiposopathic uh, immunopathies that we talk about? Well, you have an increase in inflammatory macrophages. You have a, a flip in the type of macrophages that are out there, uh, the M1 and M2. Uh, you have an increase in tumor necrosis factor, um, which results in all kinds of havoc on uh, uh, adipocyte and adipose tissue functionality. So if anybody ever asks you, how does obesity cause diabetes? As an endocrinologist, I would think you'd want to know that. That's like the most fundamental question ever, right? I don't understand how I gain body fat and now I have diabetes. Why is that? Well, here, here it's, it's written out in, in, in both broad descriptions and in, in granular descriptions. Uh, other things are, other uh, inflammatory contributors would be decreased in adiponectin, increase in interleukin-6, uh, chemokines. What about the endocrinopathies? Well, you can't forget about leptin. Uh, increase in leptin uh, can uh, contribute to the diabetes mellitus, uh, ASP, um, uh, certain uh, steroidogenic type of hormones. What about lipotoxicity? Well, what we mean by lipotoxicity is that you have these free fatty acids that get into uh, different body organs, the cells of the, of the body organs, and that if your body is not flexible in its ability to manage uh, these free fatty acids, uh, then they, they be, uh, can be transformed into uh, toxic uh, ceramides and, and metabolites, and that contributes to adipose tissue dysfunction, um, and adipocyte dysfunction. But the good news is, is that at least with regard to the diabetes mellitus, we have outcome studies now that demonstrate cardiovascular disease benefits. And we are specifically focusing on the GLP-1 receptor agonists and the SGLT2 inhibitors. Now, not every member of both these classes has cardiovascular disease outcomes data. Uh, one explanation could be there were different studies uh, and therefore, they came up with different conclusions, or it could be a different studies done with different protocols and different uh, different research sites. That's one explanation. Uh, another explanation could be that that even though they're part of the same class, they are different. I mean, they're different small molecules, right? They're different proteins, uh, so they, they do. Di there may be intrinsic uh, differences. And finally, the reason could be that the statistics just didn't work out right. Because as you know, I mean, that's, that's a whole other talk, a whole, a whole presentation on the, on the clinical application of statistics, um, which is, again, something high interest of mine. But uh, uh, sometimes uh, uh, studies don't end up with the results that we anticipate, and it could just be uh, statistical variance. Okay. so. So if we do have a patient with the obesity and type 2 diabetes mellitus, and now they don't have cardiovascular disease, 
Um, what might be a choice there? Well, I think, again, you have to go back. This is very consistent with the American Diabetes Association and other organizations. Metformin, a GLP-1 receptor agonist, and SGLT-2 inhibitors. And why am I saying that? It's because even though they may not have cardiovascular disease, they're certainly at high risk for cardiovascular disease because they have the type 2 diabetes mellitus. What about high blood pressure? If a patient or a clinician ever came to you and said, well, why does, why does obesity cause high blood pressure? Hopefully you as an endocrinologist would be able to answer that question. First, you'd say, well, the fat mass disease can contribute to the high blood pressure, the sleep apnea, the kidney and renal vessel compression, perivascular adipose tissue, uh, increase in cardiac output that you get with the obesity. That's going to increase your blood pressure. Uh, but then there are also the immunopathies and the endocrinopathies, increasing free fatty acids that increase blood pressure. Isn't it interesting that when you eat, I don't know how many of you all have wearable technologies, but if you've not done this before, um, uh, look at your heart rate like an hour or so after you eat. What happens? It goes up, doesn't it? it goes up. That's not, not magic. Just it's just endocrinology, right? Uh, yes, there could be certain things, um, uh, hormones and such that are released, but another thing that can happen is that uh, the vessels uh, in your gut expand and just ever so much uh, drop your blood pressure, and when that happens, your heart rate uh, can go up. So you may recall a few weeks ago during one of the grand rounds, uh, I brought up the fact that so, too many times in my clinical practice have I seen patients who have been diagnosed as having reactive hypoglycemia when really they don't have reactive hypoglycemia. What they have is they have uh, orthostatic hypotension or vasomotor instability or, or, or something like that. So, um, And then if you do have an increase in body fat, that increase in leptin and such, uh, an increase in insulin gets crosses the blood-brain barrier and increases sympathomatic uh, response, increasing blood pressure. Okay, increasing blood pressure. Um, certain food content, for example, sodium and such, can increase your, uh, your blood pressure. Uh, compression of the kidneys, uh, as we talked about from a fat mass perspective, can increase blood pressure. But um, the adipocytes and adipose tissue, very active endocrine organ, and it can really rev up the uh, RAS system, the renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system, which increases the blood pressure. The uh, vasculature can be affected by the increase in angiotensin II and the sympathetic nervous system activity and increased uh, endothelial vasoconstrictors, decreased nitric oxide production and decrease in endothelia-dependent uh, vasodilation and increase in arterial fitness. All these things happen uh, with the over overweight and the obesity. And then, of course, the heart, for the reasons we mentioned, can also be uh, directly and indirectly affected. So let's say you have um, a patient with obesity has high uh, blood pressure. Well, you certainly want to avoid fentramine alone. I mean, I don't know how many, I don't use fentramine very much, but many of my colleagues use it all the time. It's just that I see so many patients at cardiovascular disease risk that um, I'm just not a big, I'm not a big uh, prescriber of, of fentramine. But liraglutide is certainly a, a, an option uh, that can not only improve blood sugar, but can improve blood pressure. What about dyslipidemia? There used to be a thinking that you're born with a certain number of fat cells, and so therefore, if you had a lot of fat cells, then you were predestined to have the obesity. Well, hopefully none of you believe that's true, because it's not true. Fat cells undergo about a 10% turnover per year, and the amount of fat cells that people can have or not have can vary in, in the you know tens of billions. Uh, depending, upon, depending upon the individual and their caloric intake, physical activity, that sort of thing. Um, but isn't it interesting that uh, with patients with obesity, over 50% of the body's cholesterol is stored in the adipose tissue, and uh, the vast majority of the body energy is uh, stored in adipose tissue, obviously. Oh, the other thing that's really interesting is that the uh, delivery of... Um, of um, uh, that, that adipose tissue produces some cholesterol, but mainly relies on cholesterol delivery 
through high density lipoproteins. So I don't know how many of you knew that. The, the transfer of cholesterol to your adipocytes and adipose tissues through HDL particles and not because the adipose tissues makes a lot of uh, cholesterol. So just a lot of really interesting physiology going on. The transport of the free fatty acids into adipocytes and lipogenesis uh, can occur through various different uh, uh, transporters. And to get it out of the adipose tissue requires various different lipases. And so um, that's the reason we have so many drugs out there that work through increasing, say, for example, lipoprotein lipase activity. That's a shared mechanism of action, say, for like fibrates and fish oils. That's, that's, that's how they work. Okay. Um, as far as, so those are the endocrine causes um, of dyslipidemia in patients with overweight and obesity. But what about the immunological contributions to dyslipidemia? Well, yet again, we've got tumor necrosis factor, decreased adiponectin, interleukin-6. Um, there's that lipoprotein lipase activity that I talked about. CETP, if you don't know the story of CETP, again, just absolutely fascinating. And the story's not over. You would have thought it had been over when all the drugs we developed sort of never <laughs> got developed. Uh, but there's still people out there that are convinced uh, that CETP is going to make it um, and that HDL cholesterol raising agents are going to be helpful. I'm not convinced, but the studies are ongoing. Okay? And then, of course, we got to talk about sex hormones. Um, the, uh, let's see your sec. Okay, and then the fatty liver that we talked about, um, how, does that, how does that happen? It happens because you have an influx of free fatty acids, and if your body's not flexible, what we call inflexibility, and metabolizing the free fatty acid influx, then that's going to result in lipotoxicity, and you're going to secrete uh, very low-density lipoprotein particles, and that's how you have an increase in triglycerides and increase in LDL cholesterol. And you wonder how it is that we get the typical lipid pattern we see with the obesity and the diabetes, not complicated. Uh, if you can't store uh, uh, positive caloric balance, that, can't, that energy can't be stored in your peripheral subcutaneous adipose tissue. It's got to go somewhere. One of the places it goes, it goes into the liver, and that causes an increased secretion of the VLDL particles, which, as you know, carry the triglycerides. And then those particles undergo exchange of cholesterol for triglycerides through CETP. And at the end of the day, you end up with fatty liver. Uh, you end up with the, well, prior to that, the adiposophy, adiposophy, fatty liver, hypertriglyceride fasting, hypertriglyceridemia, low HDL particles, because those small dense HDL particles get excreted by the kidney. And then you get the uh, small dense LDL particles, because when you get that exchange of triglycerides with cholesterol, and your LDL particles, those LDL particles, they become smaller and potentially uh, more atherogenic, okay? So here we have a, a treatment of obesity and dyslipidemia. And again, you have to go, I think you have to go with liraglutide because it has the uh, best evidence. Uh, but Orlistat's an option. Orlistat, um, there's some suggestion there may be independent LDL cholesterol lowering effect with the, uh, with the Orlistat. Fatty liver, I'm not going to talk too much about it other than to say that the same mechanisms that contribute to the diabetes, hypertension, and dyslipidemia, uh, and heart disease for that matter, same thing happens with the liver. The immunopathies, the endocrinopathies, and the uh, increase in free fatty acids uh, contribute to uh, liver fatty infiltration, and, and we end up with the anaphylt, the non-alcoholic uh, fatty liver disease, and if it gets bad enough, you know, you get NASH and maybe even uh, cirrhosis. So, so that's not good. And that's, uh, that's on the incline. I mean, that's, that's uh, the, the cirrhosis due to NASH uh, is increasing. And, I mean, that's why it's so good that we're having so much research being done in obesity because I think that's the only way we're going to address uh, that situation. But here are just some slides to talk about how you can screen for it and imaging tests you might use and, various tools, and of course, liver biopsy, and the types of medications that can contribute to fatty liver, secondary causes, and then what exactly happens if you engage in appropriate nutrition, physical activity, and use uh, medications, all which 
uh, the ones that favor treatment of the obesity, most all of them also favor reduction in fatty liver. You could say the same thing about cancer. Other than cigarette smoking, uh, the obesity and the adiposopathy is the most common uh, reversible or preventable cause, the most common preventable cause of cancer. Some predict within the next few decades that uh, obesity will overtake cigarette smoking as the number one cause of cancer. Well, how does the obesity or the adiposopathy cause cancer? The same thing. You're altering the mechanisms, the, the internal workings of the cells uh, through these uh, immunopathies and these endocrinopathies and the uh, you know, fatty infiltration and such. And then a lot of it has to do, of course, with how you prepare foods and such. I mean, if you've ever talked to your patients about how they cook their foods, like not cooking them above, like cooking oils, for example, above their smoking points, um, that's when you really start to see the toxicity uh, rev up and such. So a lot, lot, lot can be gained by learning uh, the nuances of uh, nutrition. And here is... Here's just an entire listing of the oxidation that takes place. I mean, we're all familiar with oxidation of iron, which is rust and corrosion, and the oxidation of fish oils with rancidity. The oxidation of a cut apple causes it to turn brown. But oxidation within the dysfunctional fat or the increase in, in stress, uh, the intraorganelle stress, can also contribute to pro-oxidation, which uh, contributes to neoplasia, cancer, that sort of thing. The good news is, a lot of good, healthful foods out there that, uh, in addition to achieving a healthy body weight, can help uh, combat uh, the predisposition to um, uh, ca uh, cancer and, uh, 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 yeah, cancer, uh, neoplasia. All right, so I want to conclude with going back down memory lane. Uh, it was 30 years ago when I started. We started on these diabetes drugs and hypertension drugs, lipid drugs, and early on people said shouldn't be prescribing those things because uh, it's just due to people's poor lifestyle and such. And we don't have a, we don't have cardiovascular outcome studies and not sure why that you're using these drugs. And we started out with drugs that were poorly tolerated and didn't have scientific basis for their use. Uh, the fenformin, which is why it took so long for metformin to be approved in the U.S., because fenformin called lactic acidosis. Sophonyurea, the insulins like pork, you know, NPH and regular. That's what we were dealing with. But then we developed really, uh, really, really good anti-obesity agents that not only lowered blood sugar, but now have cardiovascular disease benefits. My gosh, with regard to blood pressure, when I first started, we had drugs like, you know, clonidine and methyl dopa and reserpine, and people felt terrible. They just felt awful. But then we developed, uh, you know, newer beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, ACE inhibitors, ARBs, that sort of thing. Back in the day, 30 years ago, before we had statins, we treated people with what? We called it fire and sand. So the fire was the niacin, and the sand was the bile acid resins. What a horrible thing we were doing to patients. Okay, we had data suggesting it may help them from a cardiovascular standpoint, but not easy to take. But now... We've developed statins, azetamide, PCSK9 inhibitors, more recently the pimpatoic acid. So the point is that in the past, the anti-obesity, uh, assuming the, the um, in the past, these metabolic drug treatments were poorly tolerated um, and there wasn't much enthusiasm about their use. But what was the sentinel thing that took place that changed the world with regard to diabetes drugs, hypertension drugs, and dyslipidemia drugs. What was the sentinel event? It's when we had cardiovascular disease outcome studies uh, supporting their use. And I think that's exactly where we're headed with anti-obesity drugs now. Because there's so many, uh, uh, we're doing so many cardiovascular outcome studies with anti-obesity agents. And once we, if it happens, I mean, we don't know what's gonna happen, but if it comes to pass that these anti-obesity agents that we're anti-diabetes drugs, anti-hypertensive drugs, and anti-dyslipidemia drugs, where they went from not being used to being standards of care, I think you're going to find the, uh, the exact same thing is going to happen 
with anti-obesity agents. So very exciting time. Um, again, I, I don't know how much obesity is emphasized uh, in, in the chronology curriculum, hopefully a whole lot, but I'm just suggesting that here in the next three to five years, it's going to take a dominant position in, in the practice of most any endocrinologist, unless you're only doing pituitaries or thyroids or something, okay? Uh, but, but the world's about to change, so you better buckle up. Lots going on. And uh, with that, I will conclude. I will also say that the CME event code today <laughs> is 1280938. So thank you very much. And again, this, pro this presentation was on sick fat adiposopathy, the most common cause of endocrine disease. I know it's a bit provocative, but, but hopefully I've gotten you um, uh, attuned with the extraordinary amount of research and, and the things that are happening, not 20 years from now, not 30 years from now, but just like two to three years from now. So I op can open up for questions. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Bays, uh, for a wonderful uh, summary of, uh, of this topic. So I'll invite people to ask some questions. Let me see if there are any uh, in the chat box. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, could, can you hear me? <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> you know, it's it's a little strange when you're remote. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I I have uh, a question here, and that is, you mentioned statistical effects uh, among all of these other things, mm -hmm. and actually, if you look at many of these drugs that are being uh, uh, developed nowadays, or or uh, approved, maybe that's the word I should use. Uh, they use very, very large numbers of patients in the range of a thousand or more uh, in order to get uh, these numbers needed to treat, for example, to reduce uh, heart failure. Okay, and of course, they're very expensive drugs besides. Uh, and uh, so uh, the but the relative risks that they get uh, are really very, very small uh, in the range of what they may call 15 to 30 uh, percent. And those are really non-predictable uh, amounts. That is, you can't predict much about any individual person, which is why they use the number needed to treat. Uh, so, uh, and, and also, all of that depends on the baseline risk of the people uh, that are being treated. And in this case, let's say the people in the study. But nobody, these people have differing baseline risks. Nobody knows exactly what the best baseline, they're all lumped together as having heart disease or whatever it is. So, uh, in my mind, there's an awful lot of statistical inaccuracies going on here. And not only that, when you have the very small uh, uh, relative risks, uh, that's one of the reasons uh, that you have substantial difference from study to study, because uh, it, it's just a non-predictable, actually a small amount, even though it sounds like a lot, because you're talking about 10 or 20 percent, but that's only a risk ratio, 1.1 1 .1 or 1 1.2 or maybe 1.3 in some cases. 30%, uh, which is not 30% in real terms. That is, you didn't get 30% in your exam. <laughs> you, uh, if you get up to 100% with a relative risk, then you know uh, at 101, you don't have 101, you have a two-fold difference. So could you comment on my concern about these statistics? Right, uh, and so again, as I, as I mentioned before, I, I actually have a whole a whole presentation, statistics in 45 minutes. Okay, you you so, said that, uh, right. Yeah, <laughs> so I, I've, I've got that, but um, but to directly answer your question, I, I might have a little bit a different take uh, than you. The the first thing is uh, that, now when I'm talking about out, uh, cardiovascular outcome studies, uh, I'm, I'm going to mainly be talking about lipid studies. And the reason so is because uh, we are just now doing the obesity study, so I have no I have no example to give you on there, okay? All right. But I certainly can tell, I can certainly speak to uh, lipid trials. 
All right, so the first thing is uh, the um, challenge that we have now to develop, to develop these drugs is infinitely more difficult than it used to be in the past. So we could do in the past, we could do a study like the 4S study, uh, where we use simvastatin 40 milligrams per day in patients with cardiovascular disease and treat, treat half of them with 40 milligrams of simvastatin who had LDL cholesterol 190 milligram per deciliter and treat the other half with placebo for five years. No IRB ever is going to approve that study now. But back in the day, we didn't know. And that was the first study to show a, a reduction in uh, cardiovascular mortality uh, uh, with statin use. All right, so now that's not, we can't do that anymore. So the, so, what it, so the first thing I think people need to know is the challenge to prove effectiveness of these uh, novel agents we're developing, that bar is way higher than it ever used to be before. Mm -hmm. Because now they've got to be treated with what's called standards of care. They've got to be on their antihypertensives. They've got to be, their diabetes has got to be under control. They've got to be all this litany of other things uh, that patients have to do when the, within the context of the clinical trial that, again, that the challenge to show benefit above and beyond standard of care is very, is, is very challenging. Number two, um, the criteria, the entry criteria for these, for these studies that we do are very rigid. So, yeah, they are quite uniform. I think if you look at the... Uh, I mean, you could just take an example of the, the 4A trial uh, with the evolocumab and the uh, Odyssey outcome study with the alirocumab, the PCSK9 inhibitors, um, monoclonal antibodies. You will see that the demographics, even though they're two totally different studies and in many respects have different study designs, the demographics aren't that much different. And that's because there is this rigid entry uh, criteria uh, that's, that's used. The other thing that I would say is um, I'm not, and I don't think you probably meant this, I don't think I would say that the statistics are inaccurate uh, because, trust me, the, the FDA, they have their statisticians, or if you try to ever publish, you know, like we I published New England Journal of Medicine, they have an entire, it feels like they have an entire team of statisticians that go through your statistics. So I think the statistics themselves are accurate, but where I would agree with you is I think interpretation of, of the statistics uh, is wanting. And, and, and yet again, I think that's its, its own presentation, but I'll just give as one example. This whole obsession about p-values has, has gone just completely out of control, just totally misunderstood, uh, blown out of proportion, I'm not saying that p-values aren't important. They are important. But the idea that you're just going to simply look at a p-value and determine how effective a drug is, I think you would agree that is a totally wrong-headed way to uh, interpret uh, statistics. So I, so, I would agree. <laughs> yeah. And so, so overall, uh, I think one of the, one of the issues and, and why it is, again, you're not seeing maybe the anticipated responses um, that you that I think our patients would like to see and we would like to see, it's because the bar is set so high now for these clinical trials that we do that we have to have everybody under standards of care. And we get we get asked, like, what, what uh, why is the blood pressure a little high in this visit? You know, what are you doing to get the blood pressure down? And but it has nothing to do with the study. But we have to do all of these other things and we have to show benefit above standards of care. And that, that's just not, that was just not where we were 20, 30 years ago. Thank you. Well, there are a couple of other questions here. One of them has to do with, um, you know, where can you get a DEXA scan of the type um, that you were describing, which describes body composition? Because um, generally it's even difficult for us to get a DEXA scan for osteoporosis, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, insurance is not going to approve it, you know. So where can you get this uh, approved, and what is the current clinical value of doing that? Um, so I mean, I would just encourage you if you're going to do it for body composition, 
is to just call around. You can just get on the internet and put in DEXA and call around. With regard to the paying, uh, at our site, uh, people pay cash, okay? I think it's like 120 bucks for your first one and $90 for each one. I'm not trying to sell DEXAs here, okay? You just asked me the question. Uh, but um, so in my mind, I mean, that's like, you know, a family getting door, you know, Dash and Dine or whatever, DoorDash or whatever. I mean, it's, it's for the amount of information that's obtained, uh, it's certainly, I think, well worth it um, compared to what a lot of other things cost. But again, I'm not saying people should come to our site. I think you should just call people that do DEXs and ask them if they do, they also do uh, body compositions, okay? That, that's, that's the best way to find it. As far as clinical utility, as I said, I know of no tests that I have ordered um, and, and done on myself where I have gotten more valuable information than, than a DEXA scan. It's just, it's just extraordinary when you can look at the percent body fat, the amount of visceral fat, and androvoid, and lean body mass, and for the people that are into physique compositions to see a symmetry in their muscle mass and those types of things, it's just, and then, and then you add on top of that, your bone mineral density. I mean, come on, for, you know, for, for women, how important is that? So just, just a, a wealth of, of information. And maybe one day uh, insurances will start paying for it. But, but one thing to add, let's say that you don't want to do a DEXA, but, but, but you found a high quality bioelectrical impedance. What I would recommend there, I mean, you're not gonna get the bone mineral density, but if you were to get a bioelectrical impedance machine for the percent body fat, one that's rated as being accurate, and you simply do a waist circumference with a tape, okay? Just making sure that the methodology used, whether it's right above the iliac crest or in the midriff or around the navel, I mean, there's a bunch of different ways to do it, but do it consistently because central adiposity is so correlated with cardiovascular disease, if you were to add that to percent body fat through bioelectrical impedance, uh, you're gonna go a long way towards getting the information you need uh, to treat your patients. So you don't necessarily have to get a DEXA to get a lot of this information. You can use it. I mean, I, I'd be a little reluctant to recommend calipers, although there's some people that who really do calipers right, where they do them at six different points of the body and they're experienced and they're trained and it's the same person doing it every time. Um, you know, that can get pretty close to accurate. It's just that we've seen people who have gotten calipers and there's like a 10% body fat difference between calipers and DEXA scans. So I'm a little reluctant to recommend that. But again, I'm sure there's people that do this all the time that can get quite accurate results. Thank you. So there was also another uh, comment about the cost of, um, you know, medications like liraglutide, um, you know, as to yep. what, you know, how, is it ever going to come down so that it can be more <laughs> widely used? <laughs> yeah, well, I guess when it's generic, it'll come down. But but look, here's the thing. Uh, let's just say best case scenario. Let's say best case scenario that five years, we have four different uh, anti-obesity agents who all have cardiovascular, proven cardiovascular disease outcomes benefits. Well, I mean, what does that mean? That means we have competition, right? We have, we have, we have competition, and my, my hope would be is that um, as with the lipid drugs, I mean, my goodness, if you don't think the lipid drugs are conscious of cost to the patient, then you've just not been paying attention. I mean, the, the, when the PCSK9 inhibitors, I think uh, it came out, I think everybody recognized the old model where you just charged these astronomical amounts of money for reasons, I guess, because that's just the way people used to do it. I am telling you the marketplace is changing and you don't have to look any further than some of the newer agents like bempedoic acid or whatever. The, the marketing strategies of these people, even the PCSK9 inhibitors who did what? They have dramatically dropped their prices. I think we're seeing a new day. Um, again, I've been, I've been doing this for 30 years and for, for 28 of those years, it was always the same thing. You get the same, it seemed like the same group of these attorney slash marketing people 
and they would always charge these extraordinary amounts of money, and, and they crunched all the numbers, and they thought that was the sweet spot, but I don't think that's where we are now. I think we're in a cost-conscious uh, uh, situation, and I think going forward, launching a drug at a reasonable price is going to become a priority. And I think, I think we're already seeing evidence of that now. So, so all I'm saying is, I think the market's changed. I think competition's going to help. And particularly if we have uh, anti-obesity agents that are shown to reduce cardiovascular disease risk, I think, it's, I, I think uh, it'll make a difference. Okay, thank you. Now, there were a couple of other questions. Um, but I know you had to leave it around 505 or something. So well, that's okay. No, not me. Okay. I just didn't want to waste your all's time. Oh, uh, no, <laughs> it's fine. So, okay. So there's another question here about, um, you know, do you, I mean, um, is obesity due to lifestyle and nutrition or is there a genetic component? Oh, no. <laughs> that's what you in? That's the last question? That's what you hit me with? Okay, so the answer is yes. <laughs> okay, the answer is all of the above. And that's, that's an entire, um, can, can, I, can, I, can, I, can this be my last question? Is that okay? Yeah, I mean. Yeah, okay, so let, yeah. let me answer that. I'm gonna answer it this way. Mm -hmm. So how many times have you had a patient uh, that you've seen and, um, and, um, and yes, they have the overweight and the obesity, and you, and you hear people say things like, oh, you know, they're not motivated. Uh, you know, they're, you know, this type, they don't have motivation. But yet when you talk to them, it turns out they're highly successful in their business. Or, or they might be a physician, or they might be an attorney, or a head of a, you know, big, a big CEO of a company. You're like, well, how can you say this person's not motivated? Of course they're motivated. Okay, so, so what's going on? Okay, if, if, Healthful nutrition, physical act <clears throat> inactivity, if these are things that are major drivers of the obesity, and then you add in, maybe you add in, you know, some of the genetics and such, I mean, what might be going on here? It, it just doesn't make any sense. How can people that are successful in every other, every other aspect of their life have such challenges with the obesity? And I just gave a uh, presentation on this um, at the Obesity Medicine Association uh, just a few weeks ago. It all comes down to this, efficiency. And if you wanna train your patients, if you wanna cure your, your patients with obesity, you can do it in two words, be inefficient, okay? So what I mean by that, be inefficient, be inefficient. Uh, stay away from uh, energy dense, uh, low, low healthful foods, okay? So you, you wanna stay away from the snacks and, the, and again, the energy dense foods and stuff. You wanna eat foods high in fiber, that um, uh, where the glu whatever glucose there is in or whatever carbohydrates are in the foods are inefficiently absorbed through the intestine, not efficiently absorbed. You don't want that. If you're going to do physical activity, you want to be what? Inefficient. You don't want to efficiently sit on the couch and do something on the, you know, on the video. You want to inefficiently go walk to the park and, and engage in physical activity that's inefficient. I'll give you a very practical example. It's been estimated you can burn 30% more uh, uh, calories for the same amount of exercise if you don't hold on to the treadmill handles. I used to do that all the time. I was just being efficient. I had the incline rank, you know, ramped up, and I didn't think anything about it until I read that. And so then I took my hands off the, um, off the handles it was a to like it's a totally different exercise. So I had to learn to be inefficient. If you're going to be uh, walking to a conference, don't take, don't efficiently take the elevator. Uh, walk up the steps. If you're going to be uh, parking next to your building and you're a big CEO and you're president, don't pick the parking space next to the building, although that's most efficient. You're going to want to pick the parking space away from the building. Be inefficient. There are drugs that are being developed now that are learning to uncoupling uh, the, um, the storage of fat through the mitochondria, right? You've heard of uncoupling proteins and such. That's how bears, when they hibernate, they have uncoupling proteins and they generate, uh, they generate uh, or they, they take the uh, food storage and they generate heat and such. So there's, there's, there's 
what you want there is you'd want your mitochondria and your fat cells to be inefficient in storing the fat uh, and instead burn it off as heat. And that's why you hear so much interest in what? Brown fat and beige fat. So if you think about it over and over and time and time again, um, what I think people need to learn, particularly people that are efficiency minded, is they, they, they need to totally reprogram themselves in an entirely different mindset when it comes to their body weight because they have to learn to do the exact opposite of what they've learned to do all their lives. They have to do the exact opposite which caused them to be so successful. They have to learn to be inefficient and get rid of the efficient efficiency. And for many of our patients, having that sort of altered mindset uh, might be the key in explaining why it is that they have such challenges in this one aspect of life, when in fact they have no such challenges in, uh, in other aspects of their lives. Okay, thank you. Right. Very good. Okay, so um, thank you, Dr. Bayes, and right, thank you. Uh, I look forward to hearing from you again. All right, appreciate it. Thank you.